am Jim McAdams. I'm the director of the Nanovic Institute. And this is our new seminar room. You can't believe. It used to be you couldn't even open the door of our seminar room without making one person have to leave it. And so, literally. And so this is a great feeling. And welcome to all of you who haven't been in this building before. Um, this is so magnificent. Uh, it was. Uh, it is a donation from our uh, wonder fr wonderful friends, Bob and Liz Nanovic, and um, so, so glorious. Um, today, we honor this year's Shannon Prize winner. And first thing I want to do is to say something about Mike and Laura Shannon, uh, who, are the, uh, who donated this, this prize. About a decade ago, they got uh, this terrific idea, which is why not create the best European Studies book prize? Why not do that? And in particular, why not create a prize that would be gone, that would go beyond just the sort of narrow focus on a little period in a single country's history, uh, and identify the best works in history, philosophy, theology, political science, and so forth and literature, um, and drama, and music, why not identify the best work that made a big statement about Europe? A big statement about contemporary Europe. And in all modesty, I have to say it's been a huge success. <laughs> um, this was a brilliant vision, and it's been realized. And what we now have, just to give you a sense of the gravity of it, gravitas, uh, we really have the best European uh, studies book prize in the country. And um, you can see it in two ways. Uh, we have a jury, uh, which is not me. I'm not on the jury. I don't get to play favorites, uh, you know, which is weird when I know the people who are writing the books. Uh, but we have an external journey, uh, jury that also is composed of a couple of uh, Notre Dame faculty members which is just world class. Now, if we call people and ask to serve on the Shannon Prize jury, it's amazing. They all say yes. I mean, it's quite incredible. And we think, wow, how did that happen? Uh, the second thing is uh, tremendous books. Um, we really have identified uh, people at all levels of the scholarly ladder, but also, in one case, a non-academic. Uh, who are clearly writing the best books about Europe. So it's an important prize. Um, but the fact that our honoree got it really <coughs> says a lot about her. This is where I embarrass you, Anna. I'm already embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> You've heard me say this before, that uh, I tell my students that if they're writing an essay, what they should aspire to do is be like a great gymnast, and that is, uh, to write with grace, and as far as, 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 as much as possible, to make it look easy, or at least kind of easy. Uh, and this is also true of great scholars. Um, they take on big topics, and they write about them in a way uh, it makes it seem easy. But when we look at Anna, uh, Shimawa Fuz's work, what we discover is it's so clear, it's so beautifully written, but it's also fantastically complex, challenging, uh, and many, many other adjectives. And um, this is something that uh, I have seen and um, other Europeanists have seen uh, in Anna's work uh, throughout her career from her first path-breaking book, which is called Redeeming the Communist Past, um, which is about the return of communist parties in, in Eastern Europe. How did it happen, or reform communist parties? Uh, and in this book, she focused on uh, very tough candidates, Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia. And then it seemed like, right as this book came out, suddenly there was another book. And uh, that book is called Rebuilding Leviathan, on how, why, and when new parties uh, and politicians restrain their inclinations to 
engage in corrupt behavior and abuse their systems in their uh, governments and post-communist democracies. And so here, Anna Timola, who's uh, took on Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia, and Slovenia. And I think you know all the languages, which is somewhat daunting. Now, two things stand out, uh, many things, but two things in particular stand out about Anna's work. First of all, she tackles big questions and answers them in ways that extend far beyond her cases and that are directly relevant to our times. How do we create stable democracies? Why do good parties go bad? And how might they become good again? What might we do uh, to prevent politicians from acting on their worst instincts? That's very much appropriate for our time. Um, and at the same time, her works are meticulous examples of scholarship. And uh, this is very important to me. Um, political science, it seems to me, has become so uh, overly formalistic uh, as it's supposedly gotten better. And frequently, courts generalizations that are either poorly grounded um, or trivial. And not so uh, with Anna's work. She delves deeply into her subject matter and infuses it with scholarly passion because she really cares about these issues. One can find all of the same attributes in Nations Under God, how churches use moral authority to influence policy, uh, which is a, you know, I wrote sweeping here, an incredible examination of how and why churches in some countries are able to shape government policy on education, abortion, divorce, same-sex message, and stem cell research, and why others have been much less influential in other countries. So here, Anna got ambitious again and decided to cover Ireland, Italy, Poland, Croatia, the United States, and Canada. A lot of easier languages there, at least. Um, now, the, the jury's description, this incredible jury's description of her work is, is long, but I'll just read a little bit of it. Did I just mess up your pre presentation? No, I didn't. I know I pressed something. Don't press anything. I won't press anything. <laughs> uh, they describe her book, which won this award, as an outstanding accomplishment of historically grounded and carefully contextualized comparative political science, shining a carefully focused Oh, it shines, oh, shining, sorry, shining a carefully focused light on a remarkably neglected subject, the complex variable relationship of religion to politics. Jimo Wabuza captures a patently important question of contemporary social and political life and delivers outcomes that are as fascinating and suggestive substantively as they are compelling methodological, methodologically. The case studies are ambitiously chosen and brilliantly carried off. Uh, this story should, this study should be enormously influential, uh, as it's always, as is already the case. Tonight, Anna will speak with us about the uh, very current topic of religious nationalism and populism in Europe, which I have a feeling may be the subject of another book. So. Thank you very much. It's an absolute delight to be here. Um, I was telling Jim that I feel like speaking about religion at Notre Dame is like bringing coals to Newcastle. Um, since some of the most premier scholars of religion in our political and historical life are seated, many of them in the back rows. Um, so I'm also extremely honored um, to have received the Laura Shannon Prize. As Jim mentioned, this is the premier prize in European studies. Um, so it's an utter honor to stand in the company of the previous recipients, um, scholars and writers that I deeply, deeply admire. Um, and on a personal note, it's really lovely to have been introduced by Professor McAdams, who many, many years ago taught me um, in an undergraduate course on East European politics. Um, that was just transformative and it inspired me to follow him and to become a scholar and an academic. So thank you, Jim. Now, the book, as you mentioned, is entitled Nations Under God. 
and it explores the relationship between religion, nation, and, uh, and church and state. Um, it focuses on religious nationalism, and that'll be sort of you know, the hinge on which I'll base this talk. Both the book focuses on religious nationalism, but there are implications beyond the book of religious nationalism for our study of populism. Because churches use, um, basically, thanks to religious na nationalism, churches gain the moral authority to influence policy across a wide variety of areas. But at the same time, other politicians, secular politicians, use religious nationalism as a potent force in defining and mobilizing their constituencies. So what I'll be doing today is really making two sets of claims. One is about how religious nationalism, this fusion of religious and national uh, identities, underpins the moral authority of churches and their influence in politics. And a second set of claims that's not in the book, but that's an implication of what I'm arguing here, about the ways in which religious nationalism serves populist politicians as they basically began to erode liberal democracy as we know it in Europe. So the first question to ask is, what is this thing called religious nationalism? What is it and how do we know it exists? <coughs> well, I define it as basically the fusion of religious and national identities, where it becomes very important to be a given religion in order to define oneself as being of a given nationality. It arises when churches have historically defended or protected the nation where the basically church stood on, you know, with the society, with the people, with the nation, against a colonial oppressor or against a, um, some kind of a foreign superpower, against domestic enemies and others. And so it's grounded very much in historical myths as much as in reality. No church is perfect and no relationship between nation and, and uh, religion is you know, without, without its gaps. But nonetheless, these are incredibly important sort of collective imaginations about what it takes to be a Pole, someone who's Irish, someone who's American, and so on. And globally, we can measure this um, through public opinion polls. This is the percentage of respondents. Um, the vertical axis is the percentage of people expressing a belief in God. The horizontal axis is the percentage of poll respondents answering that it's very important to be a given religion, to be a given nation. So you know, it's very important to be Catholic in Poland or the Philippines, Christian in the United States, and so on. And as you can see, there are sort of several outliers at the very top, places like, the Pol like Poland, the Philippines, the United States, um, Chile, Ireland, and others, where basically national and religious identities have very strongly become fused. We can also see this if we examine the individual histories of some of these countries. And here I'll just give you some, a few specific examples. We have Poland, where church the church basically, the Roman Catholic Church, is seen as an anti-imperial and anti-communist force, first during the partitions of the 19th century, and then in, during the communist era after World War II, the church becomes identified with the nation. It becomes a defender of the nation against these foreign efforts, these alien efforts to sort of divide and conquer the Polish nation. What results is a rhetoric of nationalism as Catholicism. When Catholicism becomes sort of the identity that the people have and their foreign oppressors don't. And so eventually this results in sort of this easy identification of, you know, Pole equals Catholic, which becomes a political slogan, um, especially in the interwar period. And so, what we see here is also an example, you know, this is a pro-life sign, a, a sort of a large billboard that was hanging um, in the early 2000s in Poland. And it's a quote from Pope John Paul II that neatly encapsulates this, that a nation that kills its own children is a nation without a future, right? And so this is basically the marriage of both religious teaching and of national identity um, as being, you know, as serving each other's um, <coughs> dual purpose of survival. We see a similar pattern in Ireland where the church is seen as an anti-colonial, anti-British force. You know, and this is basically you know, the, story, you know, the famous stories that all, you know, all people hear about, for example, the hedge priests, right? The priests who would teach Irish children their language, how to read, how to write, and their history against, you know, this, against the ban on such practices by the British, um, of, serving, you know, of helping basically foment this new um, independent republic into existence. And as a result, the church basically becomes omnipresent in daily life um, in, after 1922 in Ireland. There's an easy presumption of a Catholic Ireland to the point that public opinion polls in the 60s and 70s showed that 90% of poll respondents in the event of a clash between church and state would choose the church's side. Right? That's, you know, that was seen as the real defender of Irish national interests. But we also see other examples. We also see a, a, a very different case in Italy. This is an Italian cartoon showing Pope Pius X setting up to Kaiser Wilhelm um, in 1907. The church here is seen as an unreliable ally of Italians. And why is that? 
because the church was opposed to the unification of Italy um, in the 1870s. It, in fact, issued a non-expedit that basically said that no Italians can participate as either candidates or as voters in the new democracy on pain of excommunication. And as a result, what we see, rather than this easy fusion of national and religious identities, is a fierce anti-clerical streak in Italy. The mangia preti, right, the eaters of priests, um, of whom Mussolini was one. So this idea that you know, there's basically the church, that Italians might be religious, and they might even identify with the religion, but they see the church not as their institutional representative, but potentially as an enemy. So what does, the relig what does religious nationalism do, do for the church itself? Well, the same history of church protection and defense, or conversely, antagonism towards the nation, results in a, uh, in a societal identity on the one hand, religious nationalism, but it also leads to the moral authority for churches, to have a specific political resource for churches. Now, all churches have theological authority over matters of life and death. They preside over rituals. They give meaning to life. They tell us what happens and what to do. But some churches also become trusted representatives of national interest. They become seen as embodying, sort of the, as embodying the popular will almost, as being basically concomitant with the national interest. And this, of course, becomes a very powerful historical inheritance and a political resource for the churches themselves. If they basically have this high moral authority, they can become active players in public life. They have an active presence in public life. And they are widely respected and paid heed to by politicians across the political spectrum, not just those who might favor their policy. So there's both, both an active presence in public life and a widely shared respect for the church and its representatives. And again, we see examples of this. For example, this is the Eucharistic Congress in Dublin in 1932, on the 10th anniversary of um, the founding of the Irish Republic. And what's amazing about this is that these are church and state officials marching shoulder to shoulder, celebrating not just 10 years of Irish independence, but 10 years of church support and its role in gaining that independence, and basically sort of, you know, helping to secure the new um, Irish state. So if both society and politicians value and respect the church. Again, in the 1960s, close to 90% of poll respondents thought that the church was a massive force for good in Ireland. Um, and here's you know, Cardinal, um, Cardinal John Charles McQuaid having his hand kissed by Eamon de Valera, right, the founder of the modern, modern state. So there is this you know, deference and respect to the institutional church um, in these countries. We see this in Poland, where even under communism, right, even under a supposedly hostile regime, the church becomes an active and salient political participant. Um, this is a, an open air mass celebrated by Pope John Paul II in 1987. And what's stunning about this is this is the one place where Poles were safe to put up signs of solidarity, right? The independent opposition trade union that arose in Poland in 1981. This is the one place where we could put up the signs and the message is clear that we are standing here as real Catholics, as real Poles, not as communists, not as you know, some kind of a, a servants to a foreign power, but as real Poles and Catholics. Um, and so the real message here is that the real Poland is Catholic, not communist, and the church is its real representative. And politicians and societal representatives respect the church and seek its approval, again, even under communism, right? So Lech Wałęsa, who was imprisoned for his role as the, sort of, um, the leader of Solidarity, is nonetheless allowed to meet with Pope John Paul II at a meeting in 1983. Um, and you know, this meeting basically further legitimated Solidarity and indicated that even the Communist Party, which was ostensibly deeply anti-clerical, was mindful of the church's power in society. And if you notice, what Valencia is wearing in his suit lapel is a badge of the Black Madonna um, of Częstochowa, which itself is a symbol of Polish Catholicism and nationalism. Um, in fact, he wore it so often that cartoonists had a field day and had a picture of you know, the Black Madonna with Valencia and her lapel pin, and um, him as, as the baby Jesus. But again, what this indicates is this incredibly close fusion between the two identities and the fact that you know, there's an, it's, it's understood that one benefits the other. Now, religious nationalism, therefore, provides the church with moral authority. This fusion of political and national identities allows the church then to use this moral authority to influence public policy. And the church basically uses this enormous sort of public deference and respect for, for its uh, history in two ways. On one hand, there's sort of a, a, a political deference and anticipation of church wishes. 
So the church doesn't even have to articulate its preferences. Politicians anticipate its preferences and sort of you know, circumscribe the, 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 poss the set of possibilities, of political possibilities, um, depending on their view of church preferences. But influence, this kind of influence also means direct institutional access. And this, in many ways, is sort of the untold story of how churches influence politics. Because what we're, we're familiar with is so, you know, stories of public lobbying, of the church making public pronouncements. We're familiar with stories of the church even, of churches becoming partisan allies with political parties. But the story of institutional access and how the churches basically can both take over the state and legislate within it is one that's less familiar. And that's something that I talk about in the book, about the ways in which religious nationalism is used by the churches to provide the justification for it to gain institutional access. And this takes a variety of forms. The first of this is, in effect, shared sovereignty. The secular state hands over sectors that are normally under the purview of the state administration to the church. And so in Ireland and Quebec, what we see is the handing over of entire sectors of the state. Um, healthcare, education, welfare, and so on, in effect, are run for the church with state funding, but of almost no state oversight. The churches become responsible for these sectors. And this is justified by, you know, these are the protectors of national interests. You know, the churches are the ones who are best able to sort of, you know, to um, facilitate the national interests. And so, of course, they should be able to run these, um, these sectors. They also are seen in joint policy commissions. So, you know, the Kerrigan Committee on uh, Public Morality, Councils of Education that determine the curricula in various schools are all staffed not just by secular representatives, but by high-ranking bishops and high-ranking church representatives. And finally, what we see is the vetting of public officials. So ostensibly, secular political nominees are informally vetted by the church, by the church hierarchy. Um, and in Poland, there are these sort of, you know, infamous stories of literally the church hierarchy picking up the phone and telling the new democratic governments that the following three nominees for you know, secretary of education or so on are totally unacceptable to the church, and their names simply disappear from consideration. We also see evidence of joint legislatures. So in countries where religious nationalism gives churches moral authority, churches in effect become joint legislators, unelected um, legislators in effect. And so churches write bills and draft constitutions. Um, you know, the famous or infamous example here is, again, of Archbishop John Charles McQuaid literally sending back and forth the drafts of the Irish Constitution with de Valera, right? And you know, the archives are amazing because you've had these hand annotated scratches and you know, little notes to each other. And by the way, can we meet for dinner? Um, so it's this, you know, it's this incredibly close relationship that the church uses to basically um, put forth its views of what the state should look like. Um, in Poland, conversely, what we see is the very restrictive law on abortion that initially gets passed was initially drafted by church officials, by both bishops and church lawyers, and literally passed across the table um, to the then Communist Party as its power was crumbling. And basically the church was saying, you know, pass this and we'll ensure a peaceful transition. Um, and that becomes the basis for sub subsequent legislation on abortion in Poland. And we also see a lot of consultations. A lot of policy proposals that are checked with the church, a seeking out of church opinion. In Poland, for example, there are two bishops who basically participate in the roundtable negotiations that bring end to communist rule in Poland. And they're seen by both sides as sort of the best guarantors of a good deal for both sides, right? They're seen as sort of, you know, the legitimate people at the table. And the church uses these kind of forms of legislating, of sh sharing sovereignty, of informal consultation in several areas of influence. Um, they basically affect the legal framework. Constitutions and legal principles are written with church representatives at the table. They affect education, healthcare, and welfare, because the state basically either invites the church to run these sectors or invites church opinion on how they ought to be run. And in a whole swathe of moral policies that I examine in the book um, on issues such as abortion, divorce, genetics, reproductive technology, same sex marriage, or stem cell research. Church, the churches with high moral authority can have a very powerful voice in determining what these policies look like and how they'll be implemented. Now, religious nationalism, in other words, um, or the fusion of religious and national identities give, gives rise to church moral authority. And this moral authority, in turn, then allows churches to influence policy. But it also becomes critical in a very different domain, one that I don't examine in the book, but I'll spend the rest of the talk talking about. And that is the rise of populist parties and movements. So in other words, religious nationalism serves another purpose. And that purpose is to define the people and to provide a very compelling political language for populist politicians. Um, 
So the first question is, of course, what is populism? We now know what religious nationalism is, or how I define it, but what is populism? Um, this is a phrase that's basically being bandied about a lot these days. Um, it basically means as many things as its various authors intended to me. So to discipline this, though, I'm going to point, point out two things that all populist movements, parties, and politicians have in common. The two claims that they inevitably make is that there is, is an establishment, and those establishment elites are a collusive and corrupt cartel, right? This is the swamp, these are, this is the uquat, this is the arrangement, these are those people up top that are basically colluding in order to prevent better policies and a more effective governance from taking place. Above all, what those collusive elites do is basically preclude the representation of the people's interest. And so the second claim that all populist movements make is that what we need now is to represent the people, not classes, not political parties, not constituencies, but the people. And that, of course, means that you have to define who the people are. And this is where religious nationalism comes in, because it provides a very particularly potent and durable definition of who the people are, right? They are the community of religious identity and practice, and that defines the people both against sort of the foreigners, people like Muslim immigrants or you know, immigrants from across the border, um, but it also excludes religious minorities, secular liberals, urban elites, and all those who are not as faithful and as orthodox as this standard demands. So the beauty of you know, religious nationalism as far as populists are concerned is that it both preserves you know, a very sort of homogeneous definition of the people, but it's also one that's flexible enough that it can exclude both external um, and internal enemies. And so religious nationalism offers a very potent source of mobilization for populist parties. And it's a source of mobilization that populist parties have very much capitalized on. This is you know, the, sort of a, a, um, a graph of the votes for populist parties in Europe. And notice what happens, that basically throughout the 1960s and 70s, populist parties in Western Europe don't get more than 5% of the vote. And then around 1990 or so, that votes basically start to steadily climb and more than triples um, by 2016. In the new democracies of, or the new member countries as they now are of Eastern Europe, the situation is even worse. Because in those countries, you start off with around 15% of support for these populist parties. And that support more than doubles um, to, 30, to over 30% as of 2016. So parties that espouse these claims are very much on the rise. And some examples, you know, this sort of this gallery of rogues. There's Jarosław Kaczynski and Viktor Orban of Poland and Hungary, respectively, two very good friends. There's Herd Wilders, who argues that Islam po poses an existential threat to, um, you know, the, not, just, not just the Dutch nation, but to basically um, the, all of Europe. Um, I would also argue that it might pose a threat to his hair, but that's a different story. Um, <laughs> And then, of course, there's Marine Le Pen, right, who, as we'll see later, uses basically what she claims the definition of, is a defense of laicite, of secularism, to nonetheless um, use religious nationalism. And, of course, we have some examples closer to home. And in each case, populism requires a definition of the people whose interests are to be represented, of the real Americans, of the real Poles, of the real Germans, um, of the real Hungarians. And in almost all of these cases, that definition is a Christian one, right? It's either explicitly Catholic in the cases of the Catholic countries, or it's a Christian one. And sometimes this is, you know, there's talk about sort of, you know, um, the West or, you know, the true identity of Europe and so on. But fundamentally, what this boils down to is a peculiar understanding of the role that Christianity plays in defining Europeans. And politicians make very active use of these tropes. Jaroslav Kaczynski here pictured said this year that the church is one of the fundaments of our identity, our way of life, and Polishness. And this is a populist politician that's basically saying, you know, this is the way that we want to run politics, and without religion, we can't do it, right? This is you know, our fundamental way of life has to be defended, and that way of life is defined by the church um, and by religion. Now, the question is, why should we care, right? I mean, there are a lot of populists, but few of them have been elected into office. What's the impact of populism? And here, there's a considerable debate. Um, there are scholars who argue that it includes the alienated and the discontent, that it basically includes people who otherwise would not participate in politics. And another group of scholars that argues that no, it just erodes liberal democracy. Um, and I, in the fine tradition of political scientists, will split the difference and tell you that what populism does, it may include the alienated and the, and the, dis, and the discontent in the run-up to elections, in the elections themselves and electoral campaigns, 
But once in office, we need to take these parties very seriously um, because they do erode liberal democracy. In other words, we need to take them both seriously and literally. Because populist parties that basically make use of, the, of this religious nationalism do three things. They undermine formal institutions, they undermine the informal norms of democracy, and they persist. Their effects will be felt long after they're gone. So what does this look like in practice? Well, as far as formal institutions are concerned, we now see a characteristic sequence that's been followed by the populist parties in power in Poland, Turkey, and in Hungary. And the template is almost identical. There's a reason why we saw that photo of the Polish and Hungarian populist leaders meeting together, because they've actually held several strategy meetings where they've kind of discussed the finer points um, of what to do and how to do it. And so the courts are the first target. Um, they basically are the, you know, the, the check and balance on what governments can do. I mean, these are parliamentary democracies where in both Poland and Hungary, the parties basically won outright majorities. And so the opposition can't do much. The coalition parties are non-existent. And so the one check on power are the courts. And so in both cases, the constitutional courts are the first target um, of these parties' efforts to erode democracy. What we see are the court packing, judges' terms are being shortened, um, the domain over which judges can preside is um, restricted, and so on. The second target are media freedoms and the media in general. And so what we see in all of these countries is an attack not just on media freedoms, but on media outlets themselves. And so suddenly media are taxed very heavily. They are nationalized. Some of these outlets are being forced into bankruptcy. All of the ad advertising that the government has for various policies or campaigns goes only to those outlets that support the, uh, the, um, the government and so on. The next target after that are civil society organizations. Um, they've already been forced to very heavily register in Hungary. Many of their representatives have been sent to prison in Turkey. And in Poland, they've been dismissed as these silly demonstrators um, with you know, the hope of registration requirements coming forthwith. And the final nail in the coffin, um, which has so far occurred in both Turkey and in Hungary, is a change in the actual constitution and the electoral laws, which basically mean that these parties have now sort of bought themselves an, in bought themselves an infinite incumbency. In Hungary, um, the party was very wily. It's made up mostly of former lawyers. And so it even came up with super majority requirements on simple votes like the budget, which means that even if by you know, some fairly miraculous happenstance they'll be voted out of power, they will still have veto power over every single future budget in Hungary, um, which is a pretty amazing thing to consider, if, you know, given that um, this party was basically out of power up until 2010. So that's the formal institutions that are being targeted by these parties. But we also see informal threats. The opposition no longer gets included in decision-making and oversight. All of these countries used to have ethics committees in parliament and so on, which used to include both opposition and, um, and to government representatives. No more. The media is excluded from oversight. And so there's a, there are fewer press conferences. Only favorable media is allowed into the room. Um, briefings are held off record and so on. There's a lowering in informal norms of accountability, whether tax returns or the names of political party donors um, that used to be basically you know, given out pro forma because that was an informal norm. Those are all now kept secret. And finally, there's the funding of friendly organizations, um, astroturfing or sort of you know, seeded, seeding fake civil society organizations, and basically giving all kinds of contracts and favorable treatment to party allies, um, again, in ways that violate informal norms that were established earlier. And the problem of all of this is that this persists. What basically happens is, is that the Overton window shifts, right? The Overton window is you know, sort of the, the window of acceptable political behavior and acceptable political rhetoric. And that basically shifts. And so things that used to be considered a scandal, right? I mean, a politician basically denouncing half the country as a worst kind of polls, or a politician, you know, in the American case, um, saying things that we would think were just un unforgivable and unimaginable just a few years ago, now it becomes matter of course. This becomes widely accepted. This is simply what politics becomes like. And so the Overton window of sort of public acceptability shifts. And what used to be scandal is now commonplace. And the problem with that is that there's basically a new generation that's being socialized into these kinds of politics, right? In Hungary, where the party has been in power for seven years now, there's a whole sort of political generation that's come of age that only knows politics the way that Fidesz runs it. Um, and that can bear some real damage to future politics, not just today's politics. Now, the question is, how does religious nationalism enter into all of this? 
Well, the first thing that it does is to basically provide a very powerful definition of the people. As I mentioned earlier, the people are now defined as a relatively homogeneous um, religious national community. It no longer allows for so people who be, behave, um, believe, or look differently. But it also provides a direct justification of several policies, um, such as, for example, these checks on the courts, civil society, and media. Right? And the justification here goes as follows, that the nation has to have its interests served. And so the courts, the media, civil society, all ought to serve the interests of the nation. And of course, those interests are very defined very narrowly. They're defined both by the sort of particular vision of national history. So in Poland, for example, historiography is being changed as we speak. Um, mentions, for example, of you know, a less than heroic role of Poles during World War II are now being erased. The museums of World War II, which actually give enormous you know, priority to the experience of other countries and other people, are now being changed and fused with others to give, again, the sort of, you know, historiography of, sort of the heroic Poles during World War II. And this is all done in the name of the nation, right? And the second way in which this happens is that party basically argues that because we represent the nation, because we're a populist party that claims only to represent the national interests, then all state institutions also ought to serve the party because that way they serve the national interest. And of course this is a cynical ploy, and of course many people see through it, but this is the official justification for going after many of these institutional targets. It also um, um, uh, demonstrates itself in certain policies, such as most notably immigration. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with some of the enormous refugee crisis that occurred in Europe in 2015. Um, that is you know, more or less brought to, to a halt in last year, but which basically sort of transformed um, European politics. And according to these parties, immigration basically has to be eliminated and refugees are not acceptable because immigration threatens the national identity. It is an identity built on Christianity and most of the immigrants are Muslim. Therefore, we can't have immigrants because they threaten our very existence as a nation. And this, unfortunately, both is the discourse of the politicians and the popular reaction to this discourse. So what we see here, for example, in Poland, a country with you know, a, you know, something like a thousand Muslims within its borders, most of whom have lived there for a very long time, you have, you know, this is the, uh, this is sort of the anti-Islam brigade um, that's calling for a stop to Islamization of Polish society. And this is, you know, these are young people, right? These are not sort of, you know, the, the middle-aged fascists. These are young people, this is the future of Poland. Um, they're basically you know, going out on marches. That are, this is an anti-immigration march that took place last year. In Slovakia, um, in August 2015, at the height of the refugee crisis, the government announced it would accept refugees, but only if they were Christian, preferably if they were Catholic, um, which is a pretty strong statement. And the church reaction to this is, is largely one of horror, right? Because it's basically nurtured and relied on this fusion of religious and national identities historically but it's fundamentally opposed to its use by the populace. Um, and even when there's some policy alignment, right? You know, there's some pro-natalist policies where the church and the populace sort of, you know, would agree on the same policy outcomes. The church very much doesn't want to see it's this fusion of religious and national identities that it's so carefully fostered to be used in this way. Um, and doesn't want to do that both because it opposes its social teaching and because it basically makes the, the church implicit in partisan coalitions that could eventually undermine its moral authority. So the irony here is that the very historical identities that the church has nurtured are now being taken up by populists and extremists whose ideology the church opposes. Um, and despite, however, sort of, you know, the, the, church's, the church hierarchies disavowal of this, we nonetheless still see the tolerance of people like this guy, right, Father Jacek Medlar. Notice what he's wearing, right, on his t-shirt. That's the sort of Celtic cross with nationalism inscribed in it. This is a priest in Poland who's basically, you know, sort of the chaplain of the extreme right. And what's scary about this is, you know, the, that symbol, that Celtic cross, the way it's portrayed here, is basically used by the KKK, by the white supremacists, and most notably as a symbol of the Stormfront website. Right? So, you know, the, the internet home of, of neo-fascists. And he basically, in a series of YouTube videos, and the church hierarchy has not stopped this in Poland, argues that the leftist and Islamic aggression is a turn against Christianity and our nation. And notice that, you know, that sort of elision there, right? It's the leftists, those liberal elites, and Islam that are threatening real Poles and real, um, a real Christian Poland. And the power of religious nationalism is such 
that even secular and both populist and authoritarian leaders sometimes find God, right? Viktor Orban in Hungary is on record that refugees threaten Europe, Europe's, Christian country, uh, Europe's Christian identity. And Vladimir Putin similarly has also found God um, in order to ad advance his political aims. And so Orban here views immigration and refugee flows as a direct threat to the Christian and ethnically homogeneous and Western nature of Europe, right? And he views this, in fact, as some kind of, you know, a concerted mission by the refugees to do this to um, Europe in general and Hungary in particular. Meanwhile, um, Vladimir Putin, uh, here with uh, his wife and Medvedev, has openly embraced the Russian Orthodox Church and orthodoxy as identical with Russianness, as opposed to either any sort of other Christian religion or, of course, Islam, right? This is a way of circumscribing Russia as a Christian country. He's embraced it so far that, in fact, here he is with Patriarch Kirill of Moscow, doing something that can either be an embrace or some kind of a you know, mutual threat. I'm not quite clear what they're doing. <laughs> But sometimes it's hard to tell the two apart. <laughs> and of course, these are fairly cynical uh, ploys, right? But they resonate precisely because of the more widely shared beliefs among people regarding the fusion of religious and national identities and regarding sort of, you know, the common history of these countries, um, whether real or imagined. And even in France, right? Even in France, which is supposed to be sort of the, the, you know, the bulwark of laicite, of irreligious and profoundly secular nationalism. Um, we still see this. And so Marine Le Pen emerges as a key defender of laicite, but she does so in a way to basically point out that Islam um, is the threat, right, to this ostentatiously and formally secular national culture. <coughs> she doesn't identify, you know, Christian fundamentalists or, you know, Orthodox Jews as the threat. No, it's Islam that poses the threat. Because Christianity in this account is the default category for French national identity, right? It is no longer publicly celebrated, but nonetheless, Christianity is coterminous with Frenchness and with Europeanness. And therefore, it's not threatening to French national interests the way that Islam would be. So we don't see any attacks on Catholic uh, religious presence. You know, here she is on, in fact, you know, there's a law in France against the public display of religious symbols on individuals. And here she is um, on a TV show talking about laicite and defending this ban. Um, and you know, the, the little white sign says, you know, oh, sorry, that's not a crucifix, that's an iron cross. And of course, the symbol of fascist movements in Europe. Now, of course, we also see populism without religious nationalism. That's feasible. Um, but where we see religious nationalism, it becomes a very potent identity for populists to use and to transform as a justification for their stances a justification that resonates quite broadly among the people. And the irony here is, there's a profound irony to religious nationalism, because it gives churches the moral authority to shape public policy. But the very fusion of identities that has been so carefully nurtured by the church over the years now becomes a powerful tool for populists that, define, that identifies nation and justifies policies for the populace in ways that fly directly in the face of church teachings on those very issues. Right? So in effect, you know, churches have basically fostered a religious nationalism that then is used by their enemies in ways that the churches profoundly disapprove of and don't recognize as, as their own. To conclude, what I think this episode shows, both that religious nationalism, both in its guises as moral authority for the churches and as a powerful political resource for populists, what it shows is that religion in Europe has always been a critical way for Europeans to define themselves. It provides a cultural identity, Christendom, you know, the irony, of course, here is that Christendom used to be in the East, right? Turkey used to be Christendom. But now, you know, Europe defines itself profoundly as Christendom itself. It provides a doctrinal framework. Um, here, for example, you know, Christianity has been, and the, the social teaching of the Roman Catholic Church in particular, have been absolutely critical to the foundation of the European Union, right? In the European Union documents, you find all these references to subsidiarity. Well, that's fairly familiar and has nothing to do with you know, the way that governments are organized and everything to do with Catholic social teaching. And finally, what religion does, and Christianity in particular does, is to provide a demarcation. It's sort of a political, you know, description, a political boundary um, of national interest, of identity, and what politics are seen to be about in, these, in modern Europe. Thank you. So that was terrific. Uh, we now have some time for questions, as is our 
uh, policy or tradition, we'd like to have the first question come from a student. Yes, sir. Sure, sure. uh, would you make a distinction between uh, Christian democracy and religious nationalism? Uh, example that one could make would be, for instance, in Germany, where uh, the Merkel Party and the CDU is fighting against populism. Right. Absolutely. Um, Christian democracy has almost nothing in common with populism, and in many ways, it's actually ironically anti-religious nationalism. Right. So, you know, the so the famous story is of Satz Kalivas, and the way he describes Christian democracy is that it's initially founded by the Catholic Church as a way to protect itself against the liberal onslaught in the 19th century, only for those parties to basically acquire a life of their own and acquire considerable autonomy from the church. And what they do is basically sort of, you know, take church social teaching regarding welfare, regarding subsidiarity, regarding sort of, you know, the social justice, and implement those in sort of a conservative, um, market-oriented, welfare state set of policies. But that has nothing to do with you know, the use of religious nationalism per se. In many ways, you know, Christian democracy has in common with the church um, a, sort of a set of social teachings about what policy ought to look like, and these sort of common organizational historical roots. But Christian Democrats nearly everywhere are opposed to the use of religious nationalism in this way, and it's certainly in the way that the populists have been using it. Scott, thank you. Terrific presentation. I look forward to reading the book. So is the following thesis congenial to yours, or maybe restating it? Um, the, uh, the weaker the religion is, the stronger is religious nationalism and populism. I think this turns on how we define religious nationalism. Religious nationalism would grow in a state where religion is weak. By religion here I mean, you had civil society as one of those institutions. A religion that is somewhat independent of the state, that is guided by its own internal teachings. You show the irony of the church teaching is not being. So a religion, and here is where the secularization didn't come in quite as much as maybe it could have. I, I, you might comment on this. When you looked at the, when you show the graph of the increasing populist votes in Europe, and you put a graph of increasing secularization understood as a decline in religious practice and belief in some of these places, so in Ireland, in Poland, mm -hmm. you take the U.S. You mentioned that as an outlier case. I say Russia. You begin to map uh, rates of decline in practice and belief among the people that is guided by a kind of independent catechism, an independent, somewhat quasi-independent church. You map that along with the rise of populism and people voting and being susceptible to this fusion of religion and nationalism. You've got weaker religion, stronger religious nationalism, stronger populism, I think. You, you don't have, uh, and, and the Orthodox churches are the ones who have been historically susceptible to this. But now what you see is Western Christianity being also much more vulnerable to state manipulation, state resources, and less able to have an independent identity because the people have left in the areas that are leaving, in the areas they want, so, so to speak, control. That is, catechesis, formation, moral formation independent of the state or of the transnational regime. Anyway, enough of that. It obviously provoked a lot of thought, so thanks for the talk. Thank you. So I'm going to Again, half agree with you and half not agree with you. So I don't think secularism as an understanding of sort of, you know, religion leaving public and private life um, is either necessary or sufficient for this kind of populism, right? You see it, you know, so in Ireland, Ireland secularizes greatly since the 1990s, but it doesn't give rise to a populist movement. Italy and Spain have been relatively, you know, France for that matter, has been relatively secular, and yet it does give rise to a populist movement. So I, I'm not sure about the relationship of the, that kind of straightforward relationship between secularism and populism. What I would say, though, is that you hit something on, on something very, very important, and that is that where you have religious nationalism, the tenor of religion changes as well, right? And so religion becomes a folk way rather than sort of a, a deeply analyzed and deeply lived set of beliefs. And so, you know, in places like Poland, for example, everybody goes to church. That's just understood. It's a social practice. And everybody sort of, you know, has the priest visit their home, you know, in the, the beginning of the year. But do people truly understand their faith? Do they sort of, you know, deeply read into it? Do they deeply live it? Not necessarily. It becomes, you know, so religious nationalism becomes a substitute for a life of faith deeply lived. And in that sense, I think, you know, religious nationalism changes, secularizes the religion. Thank you. 
I, I know it's a little outside Europe, but recently the church and Pope Francis have gained a lot of attention for trying to work out a peace deal in both Colombia and Ecuador with their civil wars. Do you think if the church succeeds in mediating peace there, that they will grow in standing and become seen as a protector of the nation? And conversely, do you think if they fail that they'll they'll lose some sort of part of identity there in that country that they'll no longer be seen as, as a positive force in the country? I think given the intractability of those conflicts, failure won't hurt the church any more than it's you know, hurt anybody else who's attempted to mediate. I think success, can, depending on how it's achieved, can do that for the church, right? And so if the church can be the impartial arbiter, if it can attempt to bring in national unity, if it speaks in the name of the nation as opposed to either narrow political or regional or subnational interests, then it can very much gain moral authority. That's the kind of record that you know, moral authority is built of, right? And so episode after episode of speaking in defense of the nation and in defense of a unity of the nation, of social peace, um, can definitely bring about greater moral authority for the church. Is there a class basis to religious nationalism? Um, there is in the sense that, you know, so liberal urban elites tend to subscribe to it much less than people who are less educated and who live in rural areas who tend to be more religious anyway, right? That said, you know, I, I've been amazed at how many conversations I've had with, you know, most recently with several very liberal, very well-educated colleagues in Sweden where, you know, you scratch the surface and what comes out is, you know, we are fundamentally a white Protestant, not very religious, but nonetheless Protestant nation, right? And this is a total, you know, and, and from that follows a whole set of political beliefs about how life ought to be run. And these people, right, the refugees, are totally undermining that with, you know, with their veils and their segregated swimming pools and their different rules. And so, you know, our national identity is, is at risk. So I think very much, you know, it's, it's openly espoused much more readily and politically much more relevant to um, sort of rural, less educated voters. So I think there's a class divide in that sense. Um, but I think it's more widely shared than anyone would like to admit. Um, uh, good question. So, um, based on your talk, um, could you not could you not say that the, the root cause of the problem with the religious uh, nationalism and populism? Couldn't you say the root cause of that is just religion itself? Is it, um, well. Sure, I mean, I, I don't think you can have religious nationalism without religion. Um, so in, in that sense, absolutely, right? But I also think that, you know, that that's not necessarily a problem, right? I mean, for, you know, for stateless nations, for nations that have been partitioned, that are under colonial oppression, that are under a foreign regime, it provides an incredibly strong sort of cementing of, of the society and of the nation. It allows mm -hmm. nations to survive, right? It's priests who teach the, the history and the language and sort of make sure that this all survives over decades of oppression. So it, it is absolutely the case that it's a double-edged sword. It can produce both sort of, you know, populism, but it can also produce national survival. But would you say it's necessary for national survival? No, no, it's not. There are, there are those blessed nations who've never had to face um, those kinds of forces. Thomas Schiam, I'm a visiting scholar here at Nanova Institute. I just came from Poland three weeks ago, so uh, much of what you have said is really accurate about uh, Poland. Uh, I, I'm uh, just standing uh, on um, behalf of our church a little bit at the defense of the church in Poland. Three things have happened uh, lately in Poland, I think. Uh, politicians are using the church very often because it is pays off in a nation where 95% of people are, are baptized. You know, uh, very many of the populist parties are are rather showing that they are Christian and they are Catholics, they are very good Catholics, and uh, it, you can't stand it when you think of it and you look at it. But church, I think, is somehow uh, aware of that right now. And I, three things. You mentioned Reverend, uh, Reverend, sorry, Reverend Mendlar. He was suspended by the church. He was uh, expelled from his order, and he cannot serve any sacraments anymore. So he's a mm, journalist right now. So he's, he's not uh, representing the church anymore. Second thing, that attack on the courts uh, lately by the, the current government was uh, uh, has been um, also noticed by the church. And after the president has vetoed this, this law, this bill that was very populistic, uh, that it was very unusual. The conference of Polish bishop has issued the thank you letter to Polish president for doing that. So Polish president was thanked by the church for, for not being 
populistic, all of these in the same from the same party originally than the government. Third thing that's a good news as well is the mm, populistic government that right now runs in Poland is using some elements uh, of uh, anti-German moods. And you know what has started very lately is that Poland should ask for reparations after the war from Germans. And it was very, very significant that Polish church, which is not for very many, I would say, years, was not actively involved in the politics like that, everyday politics, used another statement by Polish bishops that church or that the government should not destroy the peace that was created between Poland and Germany in this, uh, this statement of the church, we forgive and we ask for forgiveness mm -hmm. in the 60s by the Polish yeah. church. And it, it looks like Polish church knows that it's being used by, by, by politicians, by, by peace. I wouldn't call it a right wing or Christian party. Uh, I, I think it's very often it's very complex in Poland, how you call parties and how you, how you define them. But uh, I think there is a hope that the same with the uh, issues concerning immigration, that the church will, will, will also react. Because many bishops have called for opening humanitarian corridors and the yeah. Polish government is closing the, the, everything that's possible to relocate migrants. So, you know, uh, I think there are some things that are very um, uh, positive in this, and I believe that uh, Polish church and uh, Catholics were being manipulated by politicians since 1990. And I think it was it was very often used by those that were not really Catholics. They they have no they had no faith, but they knew that it pays off in Poland. And unfortunately, they very often got into power. And final thing, uh, in Hungary and in Poland, those uh, populistic parties got into power after a couple of things that happened before. And in Hungary, the previous party was using we're lying in the morning, we're lying during the day, we're lying in the evening. So this was a revenge. In Poland, the same. Polish Minister of Interior Affairs of the previous government has said when he was typed, uh, taped, sorry, secretly, that the Polish state exists only theoretically, he said. It was very, uh, you know, moving for everybody in Poland and many other things. And they said, come on, we need some very strong state right now. So let's get rid of those guys that were running us before. And that's okay. what happened. There were some reasons for this, what's going on right now. Sure, but you know, so, so I think the only thing I would add to what you said is not just that politicians have manipulated the church since 1990, but the church has also manipulated politics, right? I mean, when it comes to education, when it comes to abortion, you know, the laws, the healthcare laws, um, the general shape of education, the church has been very insistent and has often done this, you know, not publicly, but through some various sub-channels, that it get its way. And government after government, including the post-communists, has basically allowed the church to have its way, knowing full well that without church, the church's legitimation, especially in the early years, Polish democracy could just fall apart. Um, and so this, you know, I think the manipulation runs both ways. The church was not, you know, an innocent lamb being led to the slaughter, but often- The church just wanted what it had yeah. in the middle of the uh, times when, when it was running welfare, it was running schools, everything that was done. Then it was confiscated so, by the government. Okay, so I believe you were next here. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was I was also in Poland for a couple of weeks this summer, and my question is specifically about the um, the uh, Polish Episcopate. Now, I noticed the way a lot of historians and and just generally Poles who have some knowledge of kind of the inside story of how the church works in Poland. They're sort of seeing the Episcopate in this um, transitional period. We're coming out of sort of the anti-communist old guard um, that more or less protected Poland's identity, religious and national and otherwise, all throughout the communist period. And now where PIS is in power and the Episcopate doesn't really seem sure what to do yeah. with the government of their and and they understand that they're being used to a certain extent um, so my question is with an eye to kind of um, the way the episcopate ran itself in the interwar period how does how did they make that transition now based on your knowledge of mm -hmm. what's happening um, in public life in Poland right now. And I understand the situations are completely and totally different with Cardinal Wyszynski, Cardinal Wojtyla, when they were in 50 years ago. Right. Um, you know, I think the, what, what communism had done to the Polish Catholic Episcopate 
is to basically engender in it a very hostile relationship to, to politics, right? That politics is a zero-sum game. Either we get our way or, you know, or they destroy us, right? And so, first of all. Second of all, it also cut the church off from Vatican II and the sort of whole, you know, very reformist sort of, you know, set of currents in the, in the Catholic Church worldwide. And so the church in Poland, the, the episcopate and the hierarchy were very much closed in of themselves. They were sort of, you know, closed off from these influences. They basically viewed themselves as the ultimate arbiters of what's right and what's wrong. And they felt empowered to push for a set of policies, um, you know, come hell or high water, because they profoundly believed them to be, you know, true, because they believed them to be true. And it's, what was hard won over the last 20 some years is this knowledge that this is not how the church functions in a democracy. That it can of course speak out, of course it can try to influence, but it cannot demand. It cannot demand both because that's not the church's role, certainly not after Vatican II, and because doing so for, uh, engenders a backlash, right? I mean, the church support for the church plummets every time that it openly enters politics. Um, but it's been finding, you know, I think there's a generational turnover that's not happening quickly enough. And so the church is still finding itself. And so on one hand, um, as you've pointed out, it speaks out you know, against the moves against the constitutional court um, you know, for the immigrants. On the other hand, it's having a hard time, for example, keeping people like Father Ridzik in, you know, as, uh, from basically tainting the rest of the church's name. So I think that the episcopate is still having a hard time finding itself, partly because of the legacy of communism on the episcopate itself, right? And the kind of thinking that it, it caused. And we have a bunch of uh, hands up. I want to see, are there any students? Yes. Hi, um, I'm a PhD student in theology, working at the intersection of liturgy and nationalism. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very curious, uh, particularly in the Irish context. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering about the role of state liturgies, where the churches would come together in a ritual uh -huh. event, um, sort of in, in trends that you noticed in, in your research. Um, you showed pictures of Putin and the different patriarchs. Um, so, yeah, I'm just wondering about that. Sure. Um, so I think those have become much more political than they used to be, right? There used to be an easy consensus about the fact that, you know, at the Eucharistic Congress, you know, political and religious leaders will walk shoulder to shoulder because they're involved in a common national project. Now I think there are sort of charges of mutual political manipulation that exist much more, and so it's become much more sensitive and much more sort of vulnerable project. And so state liturgies have become much more contentious, um, much more negotiated. Um, and frankly, a, less, a lot less frequent. You see far fewer of these celebrations because immediately the sort of you know, charges of politicization and manipulation come flying out. So I think the era of this easy consensus um, is, is over, for better or worse. Yes. Um, th thank you for this really, really interesting presentation. I've been sitting the whole time. We all started to think about it. And the question, I guess, that I was wondering about is, is how how far out from its core, so to speak, the strength of your argument extends. That is, the first examples I think you were talking about were Poland and Ireland. And I, I completely get that. That is that you have a, a, a population with presumably an intense religious faith and a strong established church. And you have this kind of triangle relationship of people's faith, the institutional church, and then the state. If you extend this to France, it strikes me that it's tricky, right? Because Marine Le Pen does not speak, as far as I can tell, is not speaking on behalf of any kind of institutionalized church. That's right. That's right. And there's no assumption that the French people believe the theology of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And really, Christian at that point is simply a way of trying to get at the shared civilizational heritage. That's right. So you could be Christian if you don't believe in anything and you're disconnected from the Catholic Church. And it really just means that you're sharing in the, the kind of whatever the average, this overall average of French traditions over the past so many hundreds of years. That when you were mentioning in passing people in Sweden. It sounded like they're expressing a similar thought. And so I'm wondering, is that really religious nationalism in the same sense? Because, no. you're, because you're not saying, because it seems like you're missing, like it's misses. Well, you're missing the religion part, right? Yeah. There's no church and there's no there's Absolutely. No, religion. no, no, and I didn't mean to suggest that France is a case of religious nationalism. Right? If anything, France is a case of an allergy to religious nationalism, or to religion, full stop, rather. Um, and it's an allergy that's brought about by the sort of historiography of the church as the exploiter of the French people. And finally, the revolution ends this exploitation, and then we become a modern, enlightened, secular republic, right? So, but that doesn't preclude a very sort of, nonetheless, um, connection to this whole idea of, you know, that we are a Christian people, 
right? And it's Christianity very, you're absolutely right, it's a very tenuous understanding, but it's still the default category because it is not Islam, right? It is not necessarily Buddhism. And above all, it's not Islam, right? That's seen as the big threat. And the kind of language that she uses is of this sort of you know, civilizational threat between Christendom and Islam, um, putting France squarely on the side of Christianity. So I know we mean to suggest that you know, there's a religious nationalism or much less religion in France itself. That was, the, that was sort of, you know, the exception um, example. In very sort of secular countries like you know, most, of the, most of the Scandinavian countries, you're not going to see it either. But what still remains is this sort of definition by Christianity of what it means to be European. Right? And that, is, you know, that, that stays even if you know, people don't no longer go to church and no longer believe in God and no longer have any kind of you know, sense of the divine in their life. But then, if I was a no good follow-up question, would there be any historically based definition of French or European that wouldn't have that? I mean, any definition that says, I am French or European because my heritage, in some sense, is that, would there be any way to do that without having the religious component in it? Um, well, for one thing, you wouldn't have to rely on a, on a historical understanding of the nation, right? You could have a very civic nationalism that basically says, we are a nation because we subscribe to the following 10 tenets about freedom of association, freedom of rights, et cetera, et cetera, and without basing it on history in any way, right? A sort of pure liberal project of we share the same set of ideals about how we ought to live together, rather than basing it on history, on identity, or any kind of commonality in the past. Um, I'm going to just call two more questions, and, um, and please keep your questions. Thank you very much for the talk. I just put, uh, put two fingers on the last question. Mm -hmm. And it's the following. We pretty much know that people don't understand what Christianity is about when they have this absurd notion of re rejecting the other without a second thought. I was wondering, don't they also conflate the otherness with exactly those the lack of those values you just mentioned. Because when I look at what's going on in Europe, sometimes I have the feeling that they are not rejecting Islam per se, but the lack of freedom that they think comes with Islam, and the lack of democracy that comes with Islam. So I'm, I'm always confused. Is this a matter of the religion per se, or is this a matter of what people believe the religion espouses in terms of basic freedoms and basic liberties of the person. Right. So you know, the first thing to say, it's not as if Christianity has an unblemished record of respecting you know, the freedoms and rights of people of peoples of other religions. Um, but the second thing to say is that you know, it's, it's, almost, you know, it's, it's almost like this thing that you can project anything you want onto, right? It is not Christianity, it is Islam. And so Islam means it's backward, it's discriminatory, it's intolerant, it's brown, it's very, very brown. It's uneducated, it's this, that, and the other, right? And so there's a, sort of a wide variety of evils that are projected onto the image of Islam um, in Europe. And they sort of vary from the welfare chauvinism of the Danish all the way to sort of you know, this casual racism of the Poles with everything in between. Um, and that's what makes it so powerful, right? People can project their own fears onto it. Uh, uh, some of my students here will be starting uh, looking at Europe in the 1930s tomorrow. <laughs> Good luck. And, yeah, and, and so populism, <laughs> fascism will, will yeah. be on the table. And I wonder if you could talk about the ways in which the movements that are current today uh, understand their links with the populist past of Europe in the 1930s. Um. So they adopt two strategies, right? In Germany, they disavow it. No links whatsoever to the, the, the past of the 1930s. Every place else, they make very happy use of it, where they can, right? And so in Poland and in Hungary, there are explicit references to the Iron Cross. There are explicit references to Endetia. These are seen as sort of, you know, historical representations, you know, true representative of the historical nation. Um, in Germany, you know, the IFD stays away from all of this. It initially began as, you know, a pro-austerity political party. It then basically got taken over by the anti-immigrants, but they are very, very careful. Is Emma here? Is it, yeah. We were laughing about this earlier. Then you know, they, they will, these movements will basically say, well, but we're not Nazis. Whatever we are, we're not Nazis. Um, which, you know, as we point out, anytime you actually have to say that, <laughs> it's, it's never a good sign, right? Um, so I think, you know, because that past is so tainted, there's no reference to it. Every place else is sort of a casual acknowledgement that, yeah, we represent sort of, you know, this way of thinking about the nation that stretches all the way back to the 1930s and even earlier. That makes it even scarier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a casual tolerance of what ought to be intolerable. 
Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much. Well, we have a, a couple of things for you. Uh, in the language of the guy in the White House, this is a very nice envelope. And then, more importantly, oh. and I don't have you seen this yet? No, I haven't. <laughs> That's this fantastic. is the medal of the Shannon Prize, and uh, we think it's quite beautiful. <laughs> so, thank you very much for all of you for coming to this uh, really wonderfully stimulating lecture. I'm sure Deanna will be glad to talk with you uh, afterwards. And thanks very much. No, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you.